This is a commentary on Exodus, Gods and Kings, but it's not a simple movie review. I'm going to be going into some of the deeper occult symbols and metaphors, and some of the esoteric Gnostic interpretations of the Exodus myth in a modern light. I'm going to be talking primarily about the movie rather than the biblical text here, but I want to start by giving a few general comments. In very broad terms, the myth tells of a people, the Hebrews, who were once free, but who have fallen into captivity in a foreign kingdom, Egypt. They are slaves to a ruler, Ramses, who considers himself to be a god. A liberator, Moses, from this king's court, is cast out of the palace and leads the captives out of the kingdom in which they have been enslaved and back into their homeland, Canaan. This is the basic Gnostic myth. The Hebrews represent spiritual humanity, which has fallen into material existence. Egypt represents the kingdom of the material world, and Ramses, the pharaoh, represents the demiurge, or the false god of this world. Moses represents the Gnostic savior, who descends from the world of light into the world of matter, in order to lead the fallen spiritual human race out of darkness and into the realm of light, the pleroma, which is their true home from which they've come, and to which they are destined to return. The God of Moses in the film, in Gnostic interpretation, represents the true God from which everything emanates. And there is some irony here, because the Old Testament God of the Jews is usually considered by Gnostics to represent the Demiurge. So the Pharaoh, Ramses, in the story, actually represents the God of the Jews, and the God of Moses represents the higher God of the Gnostics. Moses can be thought of as the Gnostic Christ figure, or Lucifer. To anyone who is unfamiliar with the Gnostic interpretation of scripture, this will seem confusing and very inverted. And this video isn't an introduction to Gnosticism, or Luciferianism, or Illuminism. Some of my other videos, like Atheistic Gnosticism, would give a better introduction. Let's talk about the meaning of names just a little bit. Ramses is the name of the Pharaoh. His name means begotten of Ra, the sun god. This is significant to his identification with the Gnostic Demiurge, because the Dem Demiurge is begotten. He is not the true God, but a created being. The name Moses is related to water, and it means taken out of, or to take out of. In the story, he is of course taken out of the water by Pharaoh's daughter as a baby and raised in the palace. If water is taken as a metaphor for Egypt, or the material world of darkness, then his role in the story has to do with taking his people out of the water. This theme is repeated when he delivers the Hebrews out of the Red Sea. There is almost an echo of the story of Noah's flood here, and a person with insight could draw a number of parallels between the two stories, taken as allegorical rather than historical tales. Aaron doesn't play much of a role in the film. But of course, Aaron was the first high priest. Aaron is the spokesperson to the people because Moses is slow to speak, as we're told in the biblical account. So in light of this, Moses can be seen as representing the esoteric religion, which is revealed through direct knowledge and personal spiritual experience. God revealed himself directly to Moses on the mountain, and Moses was given the law directly. Aaron can be seen as representing the exoteric religion, which is received indirectly, through religious institutions as indirect knowledge based on authority and second-hand spiritual experience received by blind faith. The name Aaron means mountain and also light. The fact that Moses ascends to the top of the mountain to receive direct revelation from God signifies that the directly revealed knowledge of Gnostics transcends the indirectly received knowledge or faith of the Orthodox Church. Aaron also means enlightened teacher, or light bearer. He is not the light, but it is through him that the light is given to the masses. The mountain is not the light, but the light comes down from the mountain. The ultimate goal is to ascend the mountain to the place of the Most High. But that's enough as far as a general overview of the esoteric interpretation of the Exodus myth goes. So I'm going to get on to discussing the rest of the film. 
You'll be able to find tons of other videos, by the way, describing all of the ways that the film differs from the biblical account. I'm not going to get into that much. I'm just going to treat the story, as presented in the film, as its own myth, and talk about it on its own terms, without too much reference to the Bible story, except where it's relevant. The film starts with the Hebrews in bondage in Egypt. It's said that the Hebrews have essentially built all of the great structures of Egypt, and this is significant. Of course, as a matter of history, it was not the Hebrews who built the pyramids, or who deserve any credit for Egypt's greatness. But as a matter of metaphor, the Hebrews, as I've stated, symbolize spiritual humanity. The great accomplishments of humanity are not the product of kings and tyrants, who have always taken credit for these accomplishments, and no great progress has ever come about as a result of obedience to authority and adherence to dogma. Progress is always the result of that divine spark within man, which urges him to defy tradition and authority, and to create something new, based on a new vision that comes to him from within or from above. This also alludes to the mystery of the ancient stone builders who erected the great monuments, not only in Egypt, but around the entire globe, seemingly as a mysteriously coordinated effort according to some unknown master plan. These builders are intimately related to the ancient mystery cults, secret societies, and esoteric schools of philosophy. Next, there is a scene where a priestess is consulted about a coming battle. As an official of the Egyptian religion, the priestess represents religious orthodoxy. This is contrasted with reason and with the true Gnostic religion represented by Moses. Moses, who scoffs at the priestess, seems to prefer reason to superstition. So Moses, in this telling of the story, should not be seen as a representative of Abrahamic religion, but of reason and Western enlightenment, and later as a Gnostic. It is clear that he does not believe in the orthodox religion of his time. In Gnostic terms, he rejects the religion of the Demiurge. We discover that the kingdom of Egypt is under attack by a foreign kingdom. This signals the eventual fall of the existing kingdom and the rise of a new empire. In history, one kingdom succeeds another. One kingdom falls, another rises. Esoterically, this refers to the procession of the equinoxes, whereby one astrological sign comes to rule in place of another, over a new age. It is a kind of revolution, or a war in heaven, you might say. In the film, we see that the old pharaoh dies, and his son, or successor, takes his place. He is the ruler of the new age. He, in turn, views Moses as a threat, and has him cast out. This almost seems to mirror Lucifer being cast out of heaven, which may be why this element was added to the film, even though it isn't in the biblical account. Throughout history, tyrants come and go, but tyranny continues. The systematic oppression of mankind hasn't ultimately changed. Moses represents a challenge to oppression itself. It isn't enough to merely be the subject of a new ruler, or a new archon to use the Gnostic term. The goal is liberation. He doesn't want to become the new ruler of Egypt. He wants to free his people and return to his homeland. This is what the Exodus is about. When a ruling power is at its height, it is difficult to rebel against. But when a power is challenged and at war with another ruling power, rebellion is more likely to succeed. Consider whether the American colonies could have been successful in their war for independence from the King of England if the British Empire hadn't had other foreign powers to deal with at the same time. In the time of Moses, the world was in transition from the age of Taurus to the age of Ares. And the Taurus symbolism is important to understanding the golden calf. The story is set just before the fall of the Egyptian Empire. In the time of Jesus, the world was in transition from the age of Taurus to the age of Pisces. I'm sorry, from the age of Ares to the age of Pisces. This story is set just before the fall of the Roman Empire. Of course, the transition from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius signifies a similar shift. What empire is the film actually describing? Students of occult history 
will recognize parallels that I'm not necessarily going to go into here. But I will mention that I find it interesting that Pharaoh's army carried red, white, and blue flags. Is this intended to identify the United States as the modern kingdom of Egypt? I do believe this is one of the hidden keys to the film. And I think that people who criticize the film for not following the biblical story very closely are failing to understand that the film is not intended to be a literal depiction of a historical event, but rather an allegorical depiction of current and future events, as well as ahistorical mythical events. It also contains criticism of the orthodox biblical tale. Armed with nothing more than what I've already said, anyone who is inclined to do so could tease out a lot of hidden messages from the film. But I'm going to move on and just briefly touch on a few random things that stood out to me. Some of these I'll explain, and others I'll just call attention to, and let you ponder the meaning for yourself, if you feel that there is something more there to be unveiled. One of these things is the relationship between Moses and Ramses. They are essentially brothers. The fact that each carries the other's sword highlights this fact. This also symbolizes that each is his brother's keeper. By extension, the Egyptians and Hebrews are brothers. It seems that there is some significance behind the scene where Moses throws Ramses' sword into the Red Sea, and where it re-emerges as the sea level falls, representing the waning of Egypt's power. Both Moses and Ramses wash up on opposite shores, and I don't believe either still has their sword. In a way, I believe Moses and Ramses, as depicted in the film, are two sides of the same person. One represents the quest for worldly power, the other the quest for spiritual liberation. As I've pointed out, Ramses is sometimes seen by Gnostics as representing the Demiurge. Moses is also sometimes seen by Gnostics as representing the Demiurge, especially in the Gnostic reading of the Apostle Paul's letters in the New Testament. There are often layers to Gnostic interpretations, so that on one level, a character or event or symbol may mean one thing, while on another level it may mean almost the complete opposite. So it's always important to know which layer you're talking about. For example, the Garden of Eden may represent the Pleroma, from which spiritual man falls into the sinful world of matter, or the reverse. The Garden of Eden may represent the world of matter from which Adam and Eve escape when they receive Gnosis after eating from the Tree of Knowledge. Egypt may represent America on one level, while on another level, America is represented by the Hebrews. But I think the primary symbolism of the film serves to contrast the two figures of Ramses and Moses as representing opposing principles. One is the archetypal oppressor and the other the archetypal liberator. Those who criticize the characters as being departures from the characters as depicted in the biblical account haven't realized that the film is dealing with the Exodus story as a myth, and that Moses and Ramses represent mythical archetypes rather than historical persons. The relationship between Moses and the Hebrew people in the film is another interesting relationship to think about. He starts out not realizing that he is one of them. He believes himself to be Egyptian. This is to say, he is identified with the world of matter. He believes himself to be a member of the ruling class, from another perspective, but discovers his true identity as a member of the slave class. This is one of the places that the film departs from the traditional story, and I think that the film does this to signify something by this change perhaps related to the master-slave dialectic, or perhaps to indicate that worldly tyrants are also slaves to their own ignorance, and are themselves subject to the suffering which arises from the lust for power, which grows from this ignorance of their true nature. It's also interesting that Moses names his son Gershom. This name signifies one who is a stranger in a foreign land. I think that in a symbolic sense, his son represents the Hebrews, or the Gnostics. He is like their father, Moses is. They are strangers in a foreign land. It's also interesting to note that at one point, God, or Malak, who appears to Moses as a young boy, appears to him as his son, Gershom.
So there is also an identification between God and the Hebrews. At the end of the film, the last time Moses sees God, the boy just sort of disappears into the herd of Hebrews as they walk through the desert. In a Gnostic interpretation, this makes sense, because God isn't separate from the Gnostic. In his deepest essence, the Gnostic is God. And the true God, which lives within the Gnostic, is above the false God of this world. This is the esoteric meaning of the well-known verse, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. One way of interpreting the plagues is a demonstration of the superiority of the Gnostic God over the Demiurge and his archons. If you do a simple Google search, you can find out how each of the ten plagues symbolizes the defeat of different Egyptian gods. Of course, taken literally, the ten plagues just show the true nature of the false god of the literalist, who the Gnostics identify with the Demiurge. So on one level, the god of Moses in the film can be seen as representing the higher god of the Gnostics, with Ramses representing the Demiurge. But on another level, there are more than just hints that the god of Moses is the Demiurge. It depends on whether we're looking at the literal level or the mythical level. The fact that God is represented as a boy in the film is telling. This is an expression of the Gnostic perception of the Old Testament God of the Jews as basically a child who is prone to temper tantrums and fits of rage, and it's hard to avoid such a view if you simply read the Old Testament and take it at face value. After the final plague, which results in the death of the firstborn sons, Ramses asks Moses, Is this your God? killer of children? This is a question people who believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible will have to wrestle with, and it's certainly a common objection given by atheists. Of course, if you just watch the film, you get the impression that the child who speaks as if he were God is in fact God. But if you watch the credits, you'll find he's called by the name Malik, and Malik means angel. In the Old Testament, the text will usually just say that the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses or Abraham or Jacob or whoever else. At one point in the film, Moses even tells the boy that he's tired of talking with a messenger, which shows that Moses is aware that the boy who is presenting himself to Moses as God is really just an angel. So this is one way that the film hints that the God who appears to Moses is a created being and not the Most High God of the Gnostics. In a conversation with one of the rulers who oversees the Hebrew slaves, it was mentioned that the Hebrew's name indicates those who fight or wrestle with God. And if we understand the Hebrews to represent the Gnostics, this makes sense, because the Gnostics are at war with the God of this world. But the struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is why Moses' attempt to lead the Hebrews in armed resistance failed, and why it was only after the gods behind the kings were defeated, symbolized by the plagues, that the Hebrews could be liberated. Of course, in the film, it's Malak who sends Moses out on his military mission. At this point in the film, Malak is very much like the god of Moses in the Old Testament, who commands the Hebrews to go into battles and slaughter other tribes, committing genocide and taking slaves. Although in the Bible, God never has Moses attempt to free his people from Egypt through military means, it is certainly not out of character for the God of the Bible to command Moses to lead his people into military action. It happens many times in the Old Testament. And I think this is what the film was trying to show. Moses is very much like a terrorist in this part of the film, actually. When planning an attack on Egypt, he is asked if he will attack the military supply line, and he says no. He answers that he plans to attack the people's supply line. In other words, he is attacking civilian targets rather than military targets. His stated reason for this is to cause the Egyptians to pressure their rulers to comply. Isn't this exactly the strategy used by terrorists today? And taken literally, isn't the god of the Exodus story also a terrorist? Would killing the firstborn son of all your enemies be considered a serious war crime? Of course. 
When he sends the plague of boils, this is the same as the use of chemical or biological weapons on civilian populations. And this isn't just something the film made up. This part is actually true to the text. So taken literally, rather than mythically, the God of Moses in the Bible is very much like the evil demiurge of the Gnostics. While I'm on the topic of the plagues, I want to briefly point out that when these disasters hit and the people are starving, Ramses is advised to share the grain from the royal storehouses. Ramses basically replies, should I starve too? This is about austerity. It's about the way the ruling class ignores the suffering of the people and even blames and punishes the poor for the crisis. During economic crises, it hoards its wealth and imposes austerity on the working poor. Ramses also orders that the workload of the slaves be doubled. So it's not hard to draw some parallels here with recent world events, especially with American and really the global economic crisis. Another relationship worth noting is the relationship between Moses and his wife Zipporah. If he is the father of the Hebrews, then she is their mother. I believe she is Sophia, or divine wisdom. In the story, he meets her at a well. The theme of the woman at the well also shows up in the New Testament. The woman at the well who Jesus meets in the New Testament is often identified with Mary Magdalene, even though the text doesn't state that she is the same person, but it is an interesting parallel. And the many parallels between Jesus and Moses make it seem fair to compare Mary Magdalene and Zipporah. Zipporah is the bride of Moses, and in some traditions, Mary Magdalene is believed to be the bride of Jesus. Zipporah was not a Hebrew woman. Mary Magdalene, if we take her to be the same as the woman at the well, was also not a Hebrew woman, but a Samaritan woman. So in two parallel myths, we encounter a foreign woman at a well who becomes the wife of the Gnostic liberator figure, Moses and Zipporah, and Jesus and Mary. Mary is often associated with the goddess Sophia. It seems perfectly reasonable, then, to see Zipporah as representing the goddess Sophia as well. And I think this is what the film intends, for several reasons. After the wedding, when they are in the bedroom, about to consummate their marriage, she asks him what makes him happy, what he desires more than anything else, and how long he will stay with her. He tells her that she is what makes him happy, that she is his greatest desire, and that he will never leave her. Hearing this, she gives herself to him. This scene establishes that he is a philosopher in the classical sense, a lover of Sophia, wisdom. To attain wisdom is his heart's greatest desire and he vows never to abandon wisdom. To such a sincere seeker of wisdom, the mother of the mysteries unveils herself. Zipporah doesn't worship the gods of Egypt. In other words, she doesn't worship the false religions of the Demiurge. She worships the true God above the mountain. Moses also doesn't believe in the gods of Egypt. In the film, he's actually depicted as being essentially an atheist. His wife is bothered that he doesn't believe in anything. And he doesn't. Moses, as a Gnostic mythical figure, represents knowledge rather than faith. He doesn't believe in the God of the mountain by faith, but comes to know him through direct revelation. He receives gnosis through a mystical experience of the divine. Going back to what I said earlier, the mountain represents received dogmas and orthodoxy. Revealed knowledge is above the mountain and is considered heterodoxy or heresy by the orthodox. This is why in the film it's said that it's forbidden to climb the mountain. That is to say that the orthodox church forbids individuals from seeking the path of gnosis. It is forbidden to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge. But Moses, like Eve, disobeyed. He climbed the mountain, and I love that he was following lost sheep up the mountain. The lost sheep, in this case, symbolize those who stray away from the fold of orthodox religion. On another level, the lost sheep symbolize the Hebrews who are lost in a foreign land, and Moses is their shepherd going to save them. The ascent of Moses and the sheep up the mountain also symbolize the wandering through the desert toward the promised land. Then there is a landslide, 
before God reveals himself to Moses. As the mountain symbolizes dogmas and rigid concepts, the landslide signifies the crumbling of dogmas and concepts. What this signifies is that before the seeker can receive direct revelation and knowledge, false beliefs must be stripped away. This is also why Moses was depicted as an atheist in the film. He was free from belief and was therefore open to receive knowledge. The biggest obstacle we have to the realization of truth is our own beliefs. Faith stands in the way of gnosis. Interestingly, Moses is buried in the landslide. This is a symbolic, initiatic death and burial. After his meeting with God, he awakens, which symbolizes spiritual birth and resurrection. His broken leg is related to the story of the sheep gone astray, whose leg is broken by the shepherd. The fact that God appears to Moses as a child is probably related to the child archetype in Jungian psychology. It's probably also related to the mythical Christ child and symbolizes the dawning of a new age, the age of Ares in the Moses story and the age of Pisces in the Jesus story. And of course, the age of Aquarius in the story of the modern Gnostic liberator figure. But who is that? Well, if he showed up, you can bet that the Orthodox would call him the Antichrist, but I don't think the myth is necessarily about a literal person who exists in the flesh. Many people question whether Jesus and Moses were literal historical figures who existed in the flesh. They may be purely mythical characters. It's not my point to try to prove that one way or the other. I'm just stating a view held by some. Another observation has to do with God stacking stones into the shape of a pyramid. And the fact that he was building a pyramid is significant for several reasons. For one, it suggests that he is the Masonic grand architect of the universe. But it's interesting to me that he built a very special kind of pyramid. The bottom row was made up of four stones, the next row had three, the next row two, and then of course one on top. Ten stones in total. This symbol will instantly be recognized by anyone who is familiar with the esoteric number mysticism of Pythagoras. The symbol is the tetactris. I always have trouble with that word. T e t r a k t y s. Tetractus. It also relates to the Kabbalistic tree of life and the tetragrammaton. It's way too big of a topic to go into in this video. But I wanted to mention it for the benefit of anyone who missed the symbol in the film. You can certainly research into it more deeply for yourself if you're unfamiliar with it. On a more basic level, the Ten Stones simply represent the Ten Commandments. The last things I want to mention are toward the end of the movie. When God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses, and Moses is carving them into the stone, God asks him what he thinks. Moses replies that if he didn't agree, he wouldn't carve them. This again echoes the Gnostic contempt for faith. Moses isn't shown as a man of blind faith or obedience. He is a man who wrestles with God. For Moses, morality isn't based on authority, but on his own inner knowledge of good and evil. He is a Gnostic. God says that, leaders falter and that these laws can guide the people in Moses' stead. In other words, the law is above authority. In other words, even gods and kings are not above the law. Under the law, all are equal. On one level, this scene may be seen as the signing of the U.S. Constitution. By stating his agreement, Moses is effectively signing the commandments. I've already mentioned that I think the film has a lot to do with America, the founding of America, and also the future of America as the world's major superpower at the dawn of the new age. I'll leave you to reflect on that instead of drawing all the parallels myself for you. But I will point you to Manly P. Hall's book entitled The Secret Destiny of America. I highly recommend it. But before I end this discussion, I want to call attention to the way the film ends with hints of trouble ahead. Moses is worried about conflicts with other groups that he expects to arise, and also has concerns about the unity of the Hebrews, mentioning that 
we're as big as a nation of tribes. A nation of tribes is an interesting phrase, which may be another coded reference to the United States, or possibly even the United Nations. But again, this is only one layer of interpretation. The mythical layer of interpretation is more universal and spiritual. Lastly, I want to point out that the final scene shows the Hebrews headed toward mountains. I believe this signifies the formation of new dogmas and power structures. Yesterday's revolutionary movement becomes today's political establishment. Today's living word becomes tomorrow's dead letter. Tomorrow's promised land will eventually become the next Egypt. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, gods and kings. The phoenix must always rise anew from its own ashes. But like the burning bush, it's not consumed. Thanks for watching this video. You're welcome to like, share, comment, subscribe, and check out some of my other videos. And I'll see you next time.